my guide to understanding depth of field in photography. Hi, and a very warm welcome to episode 162 of the Photography Explained podcast. I'm your host, Rick, and in each episode, I will try to explain one photographic thing to you in plain English in less than 27 minutes-ish without the irrelevant details. I'm a professionally qualified photographer based in England with a lifetime of photographic experience, which I share with you in my podcast. Okay then, so here is the answer a bit. Depth of field is the amount of a photo that is acceptably sharp from front to back. Depth of field is determined by the aperture, focal length and the distance from where you are to your subject. The photographer can change the depth of field for technical or creative reasons. Right, well that was the answer a bit and that was nice and to the point, even if I do say so myself. Okay, so there's a few things I want to cover before I get into the talky bit quite a lot to this. First off, why is it called a depth of field? I mean, suppose it was called depth of sharpness. That would make more sense to me. I mean, depth of field, I don't know where the term came from. I did have a quick look, but I couldn't really find out the origins of depth of field. I understand it's a field of view, depth of field and everything, but depth of sharpness would do it for me. But knowing the reason for the name, it's not going to help us, is it? So let's move on. Now, if you look into this, you'll find all sorts of complicated technical stuff. What I'm going to tell you here is just the bits that you need to know, so please keep that in mind as we go through this, because there's lots more information about depth of field, but this is the stuff that we need to know. So for depth of field, think of the depth of a photo that is sharp from the front to the back of the photo. Again, in my head, depth of sharpness, not depth of field. And I'm sure, I'm sure someone's going to let me know why it's called depth of field and why it's correct, but I'm absolutely fine with that. Now, we talk about shallow depth of field or narrow depth of field, where there's less of it, and where there's more, then that's large depth of field or larger depth of field. Now, the narrow depth of field one, I wasn't sure which side it sat on, but it's on the, on the shallow side. I mean, narrow, less, okay? Just one I needed to clarify for my own sake rather than you. Right, so sharpness. Well, sharpness is one of those rare things in photography. It, it is what it is. Sharpness is sharpness. We like this term, don't we? Where you focus is the sharp bit, and sharp focus is very important. Now, sharpness depends on what you focus on and the aperture you use and the quality of the lens and the quality of the light as well. And it was at this point that I realised that rather than being a paragraph, sharpness is going to be a whole episode all of its own. So next episode, something sharpness related. Title not done yet, obviously. So you want the subject matter and the composition sharp and the rest, well, that's up to you. Sometimes you want everything sharp. Sometimes you want the rest of it blurry. And that's where depth of field seamlessly comes into play. So how, how much depth of field do I need? Why are we interested in depth of field anyway? Why is this important? And do we need to bother about this? Yes, we do. This is very important. Use the depth of field creatively and you take your photos to another level. Blurry photos are not acceptable. Photos have to be sharp. And that is the bits of the photo you as the photographer want sharp, which is usually the subject matter and then whatever else you want to be sharp. I'll, I'll touch on this briefly, to be fair. So how much depth of field do I need? Well, the amount of depth of field, as in the amount of a photo which is sharp, it'll depend on the subject matter, what you're taking a photograph of, your personal preferences, your style, and all that good stuff. If you are taking a photo of a person, a really nice effect is to blur the background. So to do this, you would choose a large aperture. Focus on the eyes and make sure that the aperture is not too large that parts of the face are not sharp, but large enough to blur the background. Do this and you will have a better photo than if you did not do this. And if you use a focal length of something around 85mm, which is mild telephoto, you will get a more pleasing effect than you will with a wide angle focal length, for example. I need to say that if this bit sounds a little bit different, it's because I <laughs> my script was wrong. It said, um, it said small aperture and not large aperture, which is not good, is it? So I've had to re-record this one and cut this in, which I've never had to do before. Anyway, let's get back to the original recording. This is one for another episode, but um, yeah, 85mm is the classic portrait lens. So, so use that to take photos of people. Eight, 70, 85, 100, doesn't have to be 85, but that kind of focal length. 
See, wide angle is not flattering. It's not flattering to the face. So there's a little tip for you. And let's go to the other extreme, going back to depth of field. At the other extreme, you photograph an expansive landscape with exciting features in the foreground. Exciting was, was suggested by my, um, by my uh, writing aid of choice. So I thought, well, we'll stick with it. It makes a change. So you've got a panoramic background and stuff in the foreground and stuff in between. Well, you're probably going to want a wide angle focal length and a small aperture to get everything sharp. But that does not mean you have to use a small aperture for all your landscape photography. Far from it. It depends on your subject matter. But there's two very specific examples. Photograph a person, blur at the background, narrow depth of field, shallow depth of field. Landscape, stuff in the foreground, stuff in the background. You need a larger depth of field. And then, yeah, as my script cunningly says, and then there is everything in between. But as you will see, aperture and focal length are the main things, plus how far you are from your subject. For the person, you'll be pretty close. And for the landscape photo, the foreground will be, well, it could be very close and the background could be miles away. So you've got to cover all bases there. OK, how do I calculate the depth of field? Brace yourselves. It's simple. There is a formula. DOF equals U squared times 2 times big N times C divided by small f squared, where U is the focusing distance, N is the aperture value, C is the circle of confusion, and F is the focal length. Right, I hope you've all got that. I hope that makes perfect sense to you. I told you it was nice and straightforward to work out. But Rick, what is the circle of confusion? Well, I've got no idea. I have no idea at all. I have never heard of the circle of confusion. Now, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I have never heard from it until I researched this episode. And I've been doing this photography thing for over 40 years. So either I've missed something or it's something we don't need to bother about. And I've never heard of the formula that I quoted as well. So I just wanted to make you aware that there's lots of complicated stuff out there, but I'm not into that. So let's move on. Let's find an easier way. OK, so depth of field, let's just go through the terms that apply. First one is aperture. I mean, I've covered this in other episodes, but I'm just going to give you a quick recap here in case you haven't heard those other episodes. And if you haven't, where have you been? Right, aperture. The aperture is the size of the opening in the lens. You can change this by reducing the size of the opening in the lens by changing the aperture. Small apertures and large apertures are very relevant to depth of field. And let's not forget when we're talking about the aperture setting, larger aperture, larger opening, more light, smaller aperture number and less depth of field. I've got to be really careful with these. Smaller aperture, smaller opening, less light, larger aperture number and more depth of field. They haven't made it easy for us, have they? OK, so maximum aperture. With the maximum aperture, the aperture the mechanism bit within the lens. It's not actually doing anything as the lens opening is fully open. You can't see the aperture. It's not doing anything. And that's the maximum aperture. And that's the number on the lens. For example, I have a Canon 24 to 105 F4L lens. Now, F4 is the maximum aperture. That is the size of the physical opening in the lens. And it's the smallest aperture value number. The maximum aperture lets the most light in but gives you the least depth of field. OK, so minimum aperture. Well, the minimum aperture is, not surprisingly, the smallest opening in the camera lens. See, this is where the aperture comes into play. And you reduce the lens opening by increasing the aperture value. So it's got the largest number minimum aperture, but it's got the smallest opening, letting the least light in and giving you the most depth of field. Now, you could change the aperture or the camera will do it for you. It depends on the picture taking mode that you're using. But the aperture is something that is it's a conscious decision to change it. OK, other things. Focal length. Well, let's keep it simple again. This is how I describe focal length. We'll forget. We'll forget all the formulas and complicated things. This will do. If you have a full frame camera, a 50 millimeter focal length gives you a view similar to that which we see with our own eyes. Now, if you change the focal length to 100 millimeters, that is the telephoto focal length, the field is reduced and things appear to be closer and you get less depth of field. 
If you change to a 25 millimeter focal length, this is a wide angle focal length and that gives you a wider field of view. Things seem further away, but you also get more depth of field. I've added this to my list to cover in future episode. There is more to this, but the fundamentals I just told you. Telephoto lenses get you closer to the subject. Wide angle lenses, not surprisingly, do the opposite. And this, again, it takes us seamlessly into the next point. Distance from you, the photographer taking the photo, to the subject. Yet this is the other factor in depth of field. The closer you are to the subject, the less depth of field there is. And the further away you are from the subject, the greater the depth of field. There you go, nice and straightforward. So with a landscape photo, the main subject is both in the foreground and the background potentially, meaning that you need more depth of field than when you're photographing the person, where the main subject is the person. Uh, and th this is another thing that we photographers need to do. We need to consider the camera to subject distance and how this affects our composition. So you can change these and you can change the depth of field. So it depends on, on the composition and what you want to get out of a photo. And you can change the position and change the perception of depth of field and angles and all that good stuff. So this is work for us as photographers. The work starts when we start composing a photo and then we have to take all these factors into consideration. OK, so those are the three main factors affecting depth of field. But this being photography, there is more to think about. Sorry. Crop factor. Last episode was called What is Crop Factor? So if you've heard that, you'll know all of this. If you haven't, here's a very quick overview of crop factor and how it affects depth of field. So depending on your camera, you might have to apply a crop factor. If you've got a full frame camera, don't worry, you don't need to. If you've got a crop sensor camera, you must apply a crop factor of 1.5 to 1.6, depending on your camera. And if you have a micro four thirds camera, you must apply a crop factor of two. A full frame camera has a larger camera sensor size than a crop sensor camera, which has a larger camera sensor size than a micro four thirds camera. Does crop factor affect depth of field? Well, the answer has two parts and one I can get, one I can't get. The crop factor changes the effective focal length and focal length changes the depth of field. So yes, this impacts the depth of field. And this is the bit that I don't get. See, the crop factor applies to sensors which are smaller than full frame sensors. A larger sensor will have a shallower depth of field than a smaller sensor, all things being equal. Again, full frame cameras have larger sensors than crop sensor cameras, which in turn have larger sensors than micro four thirds cameras. Yep, I've already said that, haven't I? I just wanted to make the point again. I use full frame and micro four thirds cameras, and to be honest, I treat each separately. The depth of field is what it is for each camera system. So I don't compare one to the other, so I'm not worried about this. I know what I'm getting with each camera system, and that's fine. OK, so crop factor does affect depth of field, but I don't let it worry me. It's probably because of the way I take photos. It, it doesn't really matter to me. OK, so good news. <laughs> depth of field, the good news. What a great subheading. The depth of field, or depth of sharpness as I like to call it. Yes, I know I've mentioned this before. It's the depth of the sharp bits in a photo from front to back. And depth of field varies with the aperture, focal length and what you're focusing on, which is the actual point of focus and, and how far away it is. Now, I dodged this last time, but can get complicated. But here is the good news. Well, what's the good news, Rick? Well, these days to calculate the depth of field, all you need is an online depth of field calculator or an app that does the same thing. I use this thing called Photo Pills. Yep, strange name, but it's a great app app and no i am not being paid to tell you about this i'm a paying customer and i use this app to help me take photos yes there are lots of other online calculators out there and lots of other great apps but this is the one that i use and have paid for so it's an app and an online depth of field calculator and and a lot more which i don't really use i just use the depth of field bit because it's dead handy and it's all helpful good stuff now how much does this cost well well, I checked the Photo Pills website and it's currently selling for $10.99. Um, I couldn't find the UK price because I've already bought it, but it's about a tenner. It's a one off purchase and it's well worth it. And in the blog post, I will add a link to it. 
So how does the depth of field calculator work? Well, it asks you for your camera type, so it knows the sensor size, the focal length, the aperture, and the subject distance. It also asks you if you have a teleconverter, which changes the focal length, as in a two times teleconverter will change from 50 millimeters to 100 millimeters. Surprisingly straightforward. So you put the numbers in and it tells you all sorts of depth of field stuff. And it also tells you what the hyperfocal distance is. But the point is it asks you for the camera model, the focal length, the aperture and the subject distance. It doesn't need to know anymore because that's the information it needs to tell you stuff. So the hyperfocal distance, well, this is the closest point for the aperture and focal length used at which a lens can be focused, where whatever is at infinity is acceptably sharp. Using this distance, everything from half that number to infinity is sharp. So it's the closest point where everything from that point to infinity is sharp. OK, so how does this work in practice? Well, you need to bear in mind the key things. I don't mind going through these again. Large aperture, less depth of field. Small aperture, more depth of field. Long focal length, less depth of field. Short focal length, more depth of field. Close to the subject, less depth of field. Further away from the subject, more depth of field. So how can you see the depth of field that you're getting? Well, when I started in photography, the camera lens had a depth of field scale on it. And what you used to do was this. You'd focus on the subject and the marks on the lens would show you the distance in front of and behind the point of focus that would be in focus. And that was it. It was that simple. See, sometimes the good old days are good old days. And that was all we had. And oh, no, sorry. I hate it when I do this, oh no, sorry, on a pre-written <laughs> script. I did forget this, so um, let, yeah, forget, let's carry on. There was also a depth of field preview button. Now, my Canon 6D, I know it's not a cutting-edge camera, it's a few years old. This has a depth of field preview button. Now, you press the button, and you can physically see the depth of field. Well, that's the theory. The problem is that the smaller the aperture selected, the darker the viewfinder goes. So I've never really used this button. It never, it never seemed to help me. It might just be because my eyes are rubbish. I don't know. But these days, we've got another thing that we can do on a digital camera, haven't we? You can look at the photo that you've taken on your LCD screen. Now, this is a wonderful, wonderful thing to be able to do. And you can zoom in on the screen to see what is sharp and what's not sharp. It's obviously not as good as looking at stuff on a on a large monitor, but you can you can have a good look and see what what it's looking like. OK, so in practice, well, the first thing we need to sort with depth of field is how much of a composition we want to be sharp and how much of a composition we don't want to be sharp. And that will determine everything. That's the starting point, And that is down to you, dear listener. This will depend, of course, on what you're photographing and what you want your photo to look like. There is an easy way of doing this. You, you can let the camera help you. Assuming that you're using a camera to take photos, you'll probably have some automatic modes that will do all this good stuff for you. On my Canon 6D, I've got two modes, which are portrait mode and landscape mode. Now, there are others, but these are great examples, and these relate back to what I told you at the beginning of the episode. Oh, yeah, quick side note there. I had to refer to the camera manual for these because I don't use them that often. Now, another top tip, camera manuals, they're a great point of reference and they give you some really good practical photography advice. So well worth a look if you haven't done already. And if you haven't, why haven't you? So give these modes a go. Look at the photos and you can see the camera settings used. You can try portrait and landscape mode on the same subjects and see the difference. Now, you might, you might want to use what's notionally called the wrong one to get a, a different effect, which could be a different style. That's, that's actually not in my script, and it's not a bad thought. But to start with, take photos of people, give portrait mode a go, but try landscape and just see what the differences are. So what's the camera doing? Well, the camera is choosing the best aperture, along with many other things, for that subject. And this is a great starting point, and there's nothing wrong with these modes, especially if all this stuff is new to you. I mean, it's complicated enough, and these modes are here to help us, aren't they? Um, yeah, I'll tell you what I do in a minute. But if you want to get more advanced, AV mode is the mode of choice for depth of field, because this is where you select the aperture, and the camera chooses the correct shutter speed to give you the correct exposure. 
Don't forget, large aperture, less depth of field. Small aperture, more depth of field. Now, I was going to give you a load of examples of how you can calculate the depth of field, but there are so many, it's so endless, I decided I'm not going to do that. So I'm not giving you loads of examples of aperture, focal length, subject matter or subject distance. You can work that out yourself now, I've told you how to do it. So, yeah, in this episode, I'll tell you what you need to know to be able to work this out for yourself. Okay, that was all the bits I wanted to cover. Now, here is a relatively brief talky bit. The whole point of my podcast is to explain things so we photographers understand them. And when I was researching this episode, I came across stuff I'd never heard of. Now, I've never used that formula to calculate the depth of field, and I've never heard of the circle of confusion. And there was another term, different maximum circle of confusion. Now, I'm sure this is good stuff and that some people think we need to know this stuff, but, well, I've managed for over 40 years without this, so I'm actually fine not using this formula, and I I don't think I need a circle of confusion because I'm probably confused enough as it is. Keep it simple, understand your camera and the settings you use, and apply this knowledge to what you're taking photos of. It doesn't have to be a bird in depth of field. You can use the tools available to get the photos that you want. And yes, I know that there's loads more stuff that I could go on about in this episode, but I didn't want to. I've told you what you need to know to get your head around depth of field and to use depth of field to take better photos. And if there's something that I haven't explained, let me know and I can I can include it in a future episode. It's not a problem at all. So just get in touch, whatever it is, whatever your question is. Oh, yeah. Another thing that I forgot, which I just (laughs) snuck in here. This lot, it all applies to, it's all camera manufacturers. It's SLRs, DSLRs and mirrorless cameras. It's all about the aperture, the focal length and the sensor size and the subject distance, regardless of what you're using. Okay, talk a bit over, nice and short for once. What if I use a phone and not a camera? Well... Phones by default, they use wide angle focal lengths, so you're, so you're already getting a decent amount of depth of field. And then you've got portrait modes where the depth of field is electronically changed to great effect. So depth of field on phones is controlled using apps and settings rather than the depth of field scale. So it becomes more of a visual thing that, you know, you take a photo, does it look OK? If not, you change something. But you're not bothering with apertures and stuff. It's just It's just degrees of sharpness and blurriness, which is... Which is not a bad thing, is it? And what if I use a film camera? All of the above applies. Well, (laughs) apart from checking the photo you've just taken on the screen on the back of your camera. All the principles apply, of course they do. And you can use modern fangled apps to help you get the camera settings that you need. So you've got an advantage there. You've got tools that will help you. And they work fine because the principles are precisely the same. But you won't know for at least a week if you got it right or not. What do I do? I use a full frame Canon DSLR and I also use an Olympus Micro Four Thirds camera. And I tend to use wide angle focal lengths and I tend to use f8 to f11. I'm quite boring, aren't I? And predictable, and that's what I do. So with my Canon 6D and 17 to 40 millimeter lens, which is a wide angle lens, of course, and with an aperture of f8, the hyperfocal distance is 1.22 meters. And the near limit changes with the subject distance. So with that focal length and aperture, I've got a massive depth of field. So much so that I will be okay to focus in very crude terms a third of the way in and I'm all fine. This is a very general rule of thumb that you can try if you're still figuring out what to do. Just see how it works for you. This isn't in my script now. This has just come to me. Once you've worked out what the depth of field is and where you need to focus to get everything sharp, you can you can remember this and you can bank that for future photos. So you don't always have to work this out. So if I'm photographing a building and I'm photographing the interiors, I don't need to change everything all the time. I just need to think about where I'm focusing and what's in front and behind that point. And, and that's my the only thing I think about, to be honest with you, because exposure is all done by other means. And for the exteriors, same thing applies. And for landscapes, well, it's fine. I'm going to be using a larger aperture to get more depth of field and I've got a wide angle lens anyway. So for a lot of the times, it's not a problem. So for most of my work, I focus about a third of the way into the composition and that is me done. 
I know that by doing this, I will get what I want sharp. And I do this by manually selecting a single focus point once I have the composition that I want. Yes, I select the focus point manually and I use one of them. I know <laughs> there's a new Canon mirrorless camera that's got five, four to 5,000 focus points. My Canon 60's got 11 and I only need one of them. <laughs> Says a lot about me, doesn't it? So that's, that's depth of field for me. And there's a general rule there which works and it's dead easy to understand. And it's not a bad starting point. I'm not saying for a second that this will work for you on every photo, but you can give it a try and it's a good starting point and you'll be able to see doing this if it's working for your subject matter or not. So that's why I don't need to worry about depth of field when I'm on a shoot because I know it's sorted. And as I said, this applies to interior and exterior photos of buildings and also my landscape and travel photography work. So that is what I do. OK, some thoughts from the last episode, which was episode 161. Photography Explained podcast, What is Crop Factor? Strange title. I'll come on to that. Well, it snuck into this episode earlier, didn't it? Crop Factor. It seems complicated, but, well, I think I explained it okay. I've had, I've had no complaints from the last episode, which is good. And I've covered the bit I didn't cover in this episode, so that's also good as far as I'm concerned. My one thought, though, is this. I keep thinking about people who get in, into photography using the phones and wonder if they can ever be bothered about all this stuff. I mean, phones these days, they are amazing, aren't they? And they can take amazing photos. So do we really need to bother with this? It's a genuine worry. Um, I'm worried that photography will be phones and nothing else at some point in the future. Now, at the moment, cameras are still popular and out there, but things are changing so rapidly. I don't know. Imagine in five years' time, will we still be able to buy cameras? I just, I just don't know. And that is why I'm going to revisit the episode, Do I Really Need a Camera in 2022? Or Will My Phone Do Instead? And the new title will be, well, <laughs> wait for it. Do I Really Need a Camera in 2023? Or Will My Phone Do Instead? It's becoming an annual episode, but it's all good stuff. Okay, next episode. Well, it was histograms, but sharpness came up in this episode and I'm going to cover that. So sharpness it is titled. Oh, no, I think I've done the title. So the title is going to be Why is sharpness in photography so important? I've not written it yet, but I've got the title. If you have a question you would like me to answer, head over to the podcast website, photographyexplainedpodcast.com forward slash start. And you can find out what to do. And you can also go there and just say hi. It would be lovely to hear from you. And if you ask me a question, it saves me having to come up with one. It's got to be good for all of us, hasn't it? You don't have to ask me a question for a podcast episode, by the way. You can just ask me a question and I will get back to you. It might make a new podcast episode, but it doesn't have to. So if you've got a question, just get in touch and I'll give you a shout out on a future episode. Right, that's all. Well. For a change, this episode was not brought to you by a cheese and pickle sandwich with salt and vinegar crisp because I'm recording this earlier in the day. So this episode was brought to you by two pieces of toast and a coffee, which I consumed before I settled down in my homemade acoustically cushioned recording and acoustically cushioned recording emporium. <laughs> Today's acoustic treatment is, well, it's two pillows, not four in the scripts. I haven't got room for four pillows, but I do have a new blind over the window and that is my acoustic treatments done. So I'm sorted and happy, just two pillows and it's all good. So I'm going to stop waffling there because I was beginning to, wasn't I? I've been Rick McAvoy. Thanks again very much for listening to my small but perfectly formed podcast, it says here, and for giving me 27-ish minutes of your valuable time. I think this episode might be about 29 minutes long after I've done my edit. A bit longer than normal. I was hoping to get them a bit shorter too, so that's not worked, has it? Okay, I'm done. Take care. Stay safe. Cheers from me, Rick. <laughs>